morning, Dumilang Sanbonan. My name is Gutlano. Um, he said a mouthful. For somebody on the radio, I find it very awkward talking about myself. So I'm going to talk about how doing the pouncing cat got me through the pandemic. <laughs> Does anybody know what the pouncing cat is? <laughs> Gentleman in the corner, do you know what the pouncing cat is? <laughs> That's what the pouncing cat is. And um, basically, I try to use the, the pouncing cat dance and, and, and what a pouncing cat does um, as, 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 as a bit of, of trying to align it to, to how my 2020, I mean 2020 worked out, you know, um, how um, things were working out and they didn't work out and they eventually worked out, you know. Um, so basically the topic today is about how creatively branding and marketing my ideas saw me through the year 2020. I'm sure we've all had like a torrid year, and, um, but we're here, you know? So let's press the refresh button. So branding to me, um, which I found very, 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 very like, um, interesting at a very young age. Um, I started working for a company called Monati Fellas. I was working under Musa Kalenga. Um, we did some really, really cool shit at a very young age. Um, we rebranded Contempo condoms so that they could be appealing to the black market. So if you are a Contempo user, I'm the guy. <laughs> um, I'm the guy. And um, we did some really serious things because uh, Monate Fellas was a subsidiary of brand leadership um, owned by Tebe Calafe. We also rebranded, um, what's that? There's a flight that left me last week. It's... Um, no, not Sefe, the other one. Airlink. Yeah, we rebranded Airlink while I was also doing the branding stuff. We did stuff. Um, we did strategy for knickknacks. Um, I saw Cypher was on the class list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was actually, I, I was actually heading um, Cypher's brand to try and link it up to knickknacks while he was still at Yo TV. He probably didn't know that, but yeah, <laughs> I was working with his brand. And um, branding to me is the art and science of influencing perception about a product, service, or organization. And um, that to me is, 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 is really um, profound because uh, when you look at Nike, there's a science to why the tech has got a story to tell, you know, because of how it makes you feel. Uber, you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's a science behind the brand. Beats by Dre, there's a science behind the brand. YFM, there's a science behind the brand, you know? And um, that for me, like, just uh, encapsulates what branding is. And branding has also got a process. So let's say I want to start a chicken dust, for instance. Um, the first thing I need to do is, okay, for everybody that doesn't know what a chicken dust is, is the guy at the corner in the hood that is selling grilled chicken. So that's what we normally used to grow up on every Friday before you go back home. So your dad would buy chicken dust and come home and would eat chicken. <laughs> so the process of branding um, or, or starting your brand is uh, conducting research, knowing where you're going, what you're doing in that space, and how that space is playing. The second part of building a brand is clarifying a strategy, like how the hell am I going to operate in this space, um, who the key players are, where I want to play. Am I, am, I wanna, am I trying to play in the chicken dust space or am I trying to play up against chicken licking or up against Nando's, you know what I mean? So that's the kind of strategy that you need to come up with. And then you need to have a distinction, which um, is where you start designing an identity because every brand has to have like a look and feel, an authentic look and feel at that. And then uh, you need to create uh, customer touch points. So will your business be like at a container in the hood, somewhere in the corner, or is it gonna be online and you're delivering? So where are the customers going to find you? And the last one is managing your assets. So the day-to-day -day running of the business, your staff and money. Any questions? And, 
My identity. My identity is, is like your corporate identity. No, like I'm yours. What's yours? Mine, um, I'm, 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 I'm big on urban culture. So um, DJing is, 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 is like a step into urban culture. So it, it allows me to be a key player in the space while trying to figure out what, what, what's happening in the space. Like, like I'm a piano space. Um, I'm able to DJ the music, so I'm able to see what the reaction is to the music. I'm able to be amongst the makers of the music, so I'm able to see where it, it starts. And I'm also, through radio, able to engage with the end user. So I've got a 360 view of, of what's happening in the space. That's why I'm able to speak on it so, so loudly and proudly. So it's urban culture conspiracy. Yeah. The? Creating touch points. Creating touch points, creating touch points is, is basically where your customer is going to find you. Experience. Yeah, the, um, your brand, your product, your, your offering. So it's like a shop or online shop or, yeah. And then, um, Judging by the kind of year that we've all been through, um, I found this really, really, really profound. Jonah Sachs says the brand is a story unfolding across all customer touch points. And I think just looking at 2020, we've all had to reshuffle in one way or another. And we've got a, a, like a lifetime story to tell about it. I think um, when we're all grown and old and grandmas and granddads, 2020 is going to be like the go-to year of how I was able to, to go through what I had to go through. And I think a lot of parents are also going to use 2020 as, as a go-to year. Yeah, if I didn't make it through 2020, you know, you guys wouldn't have been here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I found that really profound. So I'm going to take you through what my year looked like. So 2020 in four quarters. So the first quarter, very optimistic. I'll get into that. Second quarter, fell into minor depression. Third quarter, created like my life depended on it. And fourth quarter, I was able to figure it out. So let's start with the first quarter. January to March 2020. I was living my filthiest black coffee life. I had three gigs in Turkey, I played in Izmir, I played in Istanbul. In between those gigs, somebody wanted to shoot an insert in Berlin. So I fly to Germany, I come back, I go to Ankara, and I land in South Africa. And Silas sends me an email, says, hey man, come speak to my then um, MBA class. You know, just talk them through building an, an, an orthodox personal brand. I come here, I say what I say. And before I know it, I'm jetting off to Norway and I'm speaking at a trade show to talk about like South African music and the movements that are happening here. And I played three gigs. So I played Bilam, I played Muhula Huset. Phew, that name got me. And I play at the Park Theater. And then I get an email while I'm in Norway by, from Jane Beehive saying that, hey man, like we want you to come to a residency at the Hive in Bramfontein and like, Everything is going well. Like, I can't be touched at this point in time. <laughs> he can't afford me. <laughs> Into April, Cyril Ramaphosa decides to hold an urgent family meeting. The first one. And he tells us that End of March, we are going into a hard lockdown. Everyone's excited. I'm like, yo, I'm going to disappear with my side chick. My main won't find me. And, you know, like now we're working from home. Yeah, like it's, it's just another holiday. We can chill. You can Netflix and, and, and so on and so forth. But um, the harsh reality was that um, even the brands that like, I associated myself with like, started canceling stuff. So JNB Hive was like, hey, we can't do this. Like, we can't risk this, you know? So I lose a bit of money there. And I was also supposed to tour uh, Germany in Stuttgart. 
Um, I was supposed to go to Turkey, and I think I was supposed to go to Cyprus. And all those tours were like canceled because like the COVID outbreak like was hectic that side. So um, I remember I think the day before we went on to lockdown, I was driving past the music store right here on Jansmats uh, by Vega. Driving down, I'm like, ah, let me check what they've got. I need headphones. I buy a pair of headphones. And I decided to buy a mic and a shield. So I buy this mic and a shield and I keep it, go home. We're in lockdown now, chill, 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 chill. First week is good because you're able to catch up everything that's on Netflix. You know, you're video calling friends, you're trying all these little things out and you're wondering who you can sneak in. Is your complex taking people? Is my complex taking people? You know what I mean? And so on and so forth. And um, after two weeks, it starts becoming depressing because you're all alone. You're all alone, you're not making money, and you're literally just on social media seeing every single person fall. Like somebody was dying. And the harsh reality at that point in time was that uh, when I went to Norway, a friend of mine that was with me also passed away. I'm sure you guys heard of Shoni Sani, who was at the Tembisa Hospital, who wasn't fed for like 100 hours. Yeah. yeah. I was traveling with Shoni. Shoni's my friend. And he passes away. So, like, I literally get into, like, a depressed state of mind. I'm like, I need to go test. I test. I test positive. Now I'm in bed for 14 days. Shoni's dead. You know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> It's like a mess. It's like a mess. And then, after going through all social media platforms, um, Netflix is boring now, DSTV is boring, you've gone through every single porno site, you're like, you know, fuck this, I've got this mic, and let me start recording myself, but what am I going to record? And then I start thinking and looking around what people are doing, and I'm like, damn, let me start creating playlists of music that, like, that I like. Music that I don't play on the radio. Music that people, well, I think people aren't, aren't, aren't privy to. And let me start creating these playlists. But I'm like, how am I going to present this thing? And I'm like, I come from a radio perspective, so I can literally create a seven-track radio show where I play seven songs. Literally put in, like, stings about the radio show and, and like these little ads that they play in between. Then at the end of the seven songs, I take you through the songs that I played and where they come from, the artists and so on and so forth. And that's what I did. And then I spoke to a friend of mine, Ule, to, um, he's one of my business partners and um, he's been my graphic designer for the past four or five years. And I speak to him and he's going through the same shit. Like he's, he works with like big ad agencies, like, Ads aren't being shot anymore. Budgets are being cut. Clients don't want to commit. And I'm like, dude, like, let's just do this just so that like, we get our minds of things. And he starts creating what I started calling the Crook Radio. So I start the Crook Radio um, sometime in April. Do my first show, second show, third show, fourth show. You know what I mean? Keep on pushing every day. Like, just push it out through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and a broadcast on WhatsApp. I mean, I was, I, was, I was spamming the poor guy. I was spamming the poor guy. And before I knew it, we had 30 shows, you know? And during that period, there were days where like the internet's not working properly, uh, maybe I'm lazy, maybe I don't feel like doing this, and people are WhatsApping you, asking you, where's the next show? I'm like, damn, so I've really created like a cult following because, um, what you need to remember about lockdown and, and the first lockdown was that um, because nobody was ready for this thing, like there was no soccer on TV, our favorite TV shows would go on like production breaks because there's been like a, a COVID-19 outbreak on, on set and you know what I mean? So now there's no The River, there's no, there's no Scheme Sam, you know what I mean? So we're literally all screwed. Even like your favorite radio stations, where your favorite radio guy is probably off for like the next two weeks because he's got COVID, you know? And um, the only thing that brought a little bit of sense of normality was this. 
And when I started speaking to a lot of my friends within the creative industry and, and, and within the branding space, they really, really, really said that like, this thing gets us going, you know? Because um, like now we can't sit in like big boardrooms and like strategize and come up like with creative ideas. Like now we need to sit on Zoom and, and like that's not inspiring. So we pushed 32 shows and then um, we further pushed um, to day 50. And on day 50, I decided, you know, I'm a bit tired. I want to take a little break. On day 51, I kid you not, which is July, I get a call from X. And the lady's like, hey, dude, I like what you do. I like what you've been doing for all of us. We've got a campaign for you because um, we really, really, really want to see how we can play in this digital space. And also, we want to support self-sufficient creatives like yourself during this horrid time. I'm like, damn, money. <laughs> and after three months, that's the first coin that I made. Following day, I get a call from Bona magazine. Say, hey, man, we like this, the crook radio thing, blah, 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 blah. Talk to us about it. What is it about? And then, 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 then. I think two days later, um, I think it was Daily Sun, they call me. They also want to know um, what I'm doing with this, the crook radio thing. And, and like, like now, this thing like has got a life of its own because um, it, it, it's, it's, it's making me money. It's getting me busy. And I'm also encouraged to, to do more around it. And then the, the turning point comes in August. So the 1st of August, I get a call from a British lady. This British lady is like, hey, may I please speak to the crook? I'm like, hey, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and to, like, I'm, I can hear this person talking, but I'm like, ah, this is a scam, bruh. This is scary. I'm like, somebody from London. I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, hey, man, we've been following you. We've been following you. You're the Crook Radio. Um, we've also started, like, tracking back where you come from, from a wife and perspective. And um, we'd like you to be on our platform, which is the Beat London 103.6 FM. The Beat London is, is to black people out in London. And I'm like, whoa, okay. Like, send me paperwork. Let's see. She sends contracts, she, you know what I mean? They're like, these people were ready. And these people weren't taking no for an answer. And they're like, we want you to do an I'm a piano show. I'm like, whoa, okay. That's odd, you know? And um, I sit for a day. I call her back via WhatsApp, and I agree. And um, they tell me that, okay, the show's going to start in the next four days. And I'm like, dude, like, we need, like, a, a big bang um, to to actually like promo the show so that people know who we are, what we're about, and how we got here. Because um, it's one thing to get onto like a South African radio platform because um, we all know each other. So like um, trajectory is easy to explain in this region, you know what I mean? But I'm an African guy in London. I don't even stay there. I've never even been there. And now I've got a radio show when people like have probably been hounding the poor radio station and the lady to get them onto the platform, you know? So we shoot what I just played for you, and, and, and that got us, you know what I mean, that got us a lot of buy-in. They tweeted me on the 5th of August. They tweeted me on the 5th of August, welcome me, and like now I realize that this shit is really happening. And likes start from like 100, 200, yeah, whatever, 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 whatever. And then I get a like from WizKid, I'm like, damn. I start crapping myself. <laughs> You don't know who WizKid is? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> WizKid is like uh, one of Africa's biggest exports in terms of music. He's, he's Nigerian, and um, he's currently in the States right now. Yeah, he's got a phenomenal album. Yeah. So um, I do two shows. The shows go well, and it's almost my birthday, which is on the 22nd of August. And I'm like, damn, man, I'm doing well. Um, I've got money coming in, you know what I mean, unorthodox income streams. And I'm like, let me go buy myself a pair of sneakers in Santin. So drive to Santin City, put on my mask, sanitize, you know what I mean, the works. Go to Diesel, looking at all these sneakers. And then somehow, while I'm waiting for the guy to try to get me a size, I'm on Twitter. 
Casper and AKA like a fighting, you know? Like, yeah, you better sign the contract. You better, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm a better rapper than you, this, that, and the other. And I'm like, damn. A light bulb switch, the switch is on. And I'm thinking to myself, if these guys are, are backing this thing so much, who owns it? Who owns hip hop? You know, do they own it? No. But there's probably a guy that's just sitting there that trademarked the word hip hop that is sitting there and is enjoying what everyone is doing from the gallery. And then I ask myself that, damn, I've done so much for the Ama Piano sound. I've literally crossed borders with the sound and I put in all the work for the sound. Who owns the phrase Ama Piano? And I call a friend of mine who is a lawyer and I'm like, hey, dude, how clued up are you with like trademarks and IPs and whatever? It's like, nah, I'm not too sure, but I've got a friend. His name is Malachi. He's from Pretoria. He does these things. He calls him. And oh, in the conversation, I ask him that please check if the word Amapiano has been trademarked yet. Calls him. The word Amapiano is not trademarked yet. And then he calls me back. He's like, no, it's not. I'm like, how much is it to trademark it? It's like 4,000 Rand. I kid you not, I was wearing one sneaker that was mine, <laughs> waiting for a size. I took 4,000 Rand, I sent it to that guy, and I was like, to that guy, Nyabonga, and I walked out. And for my birthday, I bought myself a trademark, and I own the word Amapiano. <laughs> so now, I own the word Amapiano. What next? So you, you get these papers, you know? You tell your friends, yeah, I own a mafia. What next? <laughs> you know? But um, it's a good mindset to be in because um, you start thinking equity. You start thinking purpose. You start thinking what's more I can do for myself, you know, and, and, and what my role is, you know? And um, I remember back in 2016, Sony Music almost signed me as an artist and as a DJ and as a producer. And um, I was going to bring the contract. I just forgot it. And... <laughs> But it's, it's a worthless piece of paper, I'll tell you that. And um, to cut a long story short, um, whatever they would have, from a rand, no? I would have made 23 cents. And if I sold 10,000 copies, I would have made 24 cents. I'm like, what kind of fuckery is this? Where I create, I sell, I position myself, I'm out there doing all these interviews, I'm getting dumped left, right, and center because I'm not home with my girl or whoever that I'm with, and I'm only making 24 cents. Like, these guys are crazy. I don't do it. So in September, I set up a company. I'm like, fuck it, I'm signing myself. I started Rubik's Cube Agency, and my slogan is, we'll figure it out. So I signed myself, and then later in September, we have another family meeting, cringing, and then um, Cyril Ramaphosa, says, uh, you guys have been behaving, you know, um, it's getting warmer, so let's take you guys to level two. Like, damn. So, so I've had an entity called Magic Day Club. So Magic Day Club um, started as, as just a, a little party for my friends and I to, to chill whenever I come back overseas because um, you'd find that you'd go away for a couple of months and then when you come back from touring, everyone wants to sit down with you and ask you, like, what's this country like? I want to go on holiday. I want to take the Mehdi out. You know what I mean? I want to take my woman. You know what I mean? It's, it's our anniversary. And, 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 and so I created Magic Day Club to almost, like, mimic the things that I experienced overseas into, like, one setting and almost kill many birds with one stone so that I can invite all my friends and we can literally just chill out and talk about my trip, you know? So I did that for two years, but it was very informal, very chilled. Um, I didn't charge people a lot, and it was whatever, and I, and I DJ the whole night, and you know what I mean? But this year, I was like, damn, man, I think we can monetize this thing. So I speak to my then team, which was like two people. I speak to my team, and they're like, yeah, man, um, I think with the kind of numbers that we're bringing in, and with the kind of vibe that we were creating, um, I think we'll be able to, to tick all the right boxes in terms of like regulations and, and making sure that we don't get trouble with, with the law and so on and so forth. And, and um, 
to cut a long story short, we do our first Magic Day Club. We put out tickets on the 10th of October, and on the 12th of October, I get a call from Web Ticket saying that you are sold out. So I sold 400 tickets in two days at 200 Rand a pop. Now I'm happy. Now I'm like, damn, like, we sold 200, I mean, we sold 400 tickets at 200 a pop during a pandemic. People really, really, really believe in the kind of shit that we do. <laughs> they really believe in the shit that we do. And to top it all, Corona comes, uh, Corona comes on because they saw the promo video and say, hey, man, we really like this thing. Um, we're trying to, 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 to get back from, from like the bad publicity that we've had over the months. And we really want to be the headline sponsor for, for this thing and more money in the bank. And um, to cut a long story short, my summer 2020, we sold out all three events. Um, the biggest names in South African music wanted to perform at this thing. So we got them for almost like close to nothing. Um, I was able to employ eight young people. Uh, one of them is here. His name is Sandile. I was able to um, subcontract um, about four or five young companies that play in the entertainment space. Yeah, we did like amazing stuff, man. And um, the thing that topped it off was when um, Mixmag and um, all the guys that like listen to like house music and whatever will know what Mixmag is, like the biggest um, electronic music publication in the world, um, sends me an email and they're like, hey, dude, like we want you to be our cover boy for like December and we want you to do like a top 20 tracks of like 2020. And that to me was like mind blowing. So, that was 2020. Started very bad and ended like on a flippin' high. But enough about me. The three things and three lessons that I learned during 2020. And the first one is resourcefulness comes from dire circumstances. I bought a mic and recorded myself and literally spammed everybody and this thing became a thing, a way of life, you know what I mean? It's an entity that got people through whatever rubbish they were going through when the first lockdown hit. And um, I looked at some of my peers that really, really also like were resourceful within that period and ended up doing like really, really, and building really great entities. I mean, Shimza was one of them. Um, him and a couple of friends decided Weekend before lockdown, they're going to go to someone's house, um, record their sets, and put it onto their Facebook platforms. And before that thing started, it was called like quarantine party or something like that. And um, that thing happened on a Saturday. On the Sunday, Channel O calls them and is like, guys, we want to put this on TV because of the kind of numbers that you guys are bringing. You know? And that is a win for his brand. You know? That's a win for his brand. But... The purpose comes in where this thing molds into a platform where Shimza is able to play other, pay other artists that aren't gigging at the time and also is able to become like an outlet for artists because artists stay creating. So they're able to perform new material and is able to pay them. Black Coffee, another guy, he started something called Homebrewed Sessions because um, if you know, uh, the European summer starts in April. He had like a long list of like itineraries. <laughs> he had a huge itinerary, a bigger part of him. And um, his game changed, you know? He decided to take his iPhone, he bought a ring light, started recording himself, and he was like, I am going to speak to a couple of NGOs, I'm gonna to speak to a couple of NGOs, and um, when I start mixing, um, I'm gonna start like a crowdfunding kind of thing where uh, we're able to raise money for people that are affected by, by COVID-19. Homebrewed Sessions, at the end of it all, was able to raise over half a million rand, which that for me is game changing. And it really just took him switching on his iPhone, going live on his Twitch account and Instagram account and mixing, which is what he normally does. So resourcefulness comes from dire circumstances. That was my first lesson that I learned. 
Second lesson that I learned is that do not be imprisoned by what the, the initial plan is, that you fail to embrace innovation. One thing that I really, really, really liked about um, lockdown was this girl. <laughs> like the last weekend of, of us being free, this girl was at Peli Chisanyama and she was like just enjoying the last dance, you know? <laughs> and people like, she, 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 she took a whistle jumped in the club and was literally dancing for her life because she knew she wouldn't be able to dance for another year or so. And uh, she went viral and like guys started like taking this girl's video, putting on their own music and so on and so forth. And media entities started like thinking like, who the hell is this girl that, 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 that like is like breaking social media, you know? And, and I think like all that happened so nicely for her because it came at a time where um, we're all sitting at home and like we literally saw her brand build right in front of us because we are all in front of our phones. And um, what I really, really loved about and where the culture shifted and, 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 and the approval happened was that Vodacom was sitting looking for a strategy for the Shake Off 2020 campaign and they were like, let's actually invest in a success story. Let's go back to what is moving culture and let's embrace it, which is what this thing should be about, you know? We love success stories as South Africans. We love the underdog winning at the end as South Africans. So they went and found this girl and put her on their campaign and she's making quite a bit of money. But there are also brands for me that failed this. And I'm gonna get into trouble with this one. Savannah's one of them. So I've done a couple of gigs with Savannah. They paid me a lot of money. And, but I don't care, but they just got it all wrong. So traditionally Savannah is, is like, uh, well, the Savannah ad campaigns were about like middle white black men sitting at the bar and telling each other dry jokes um, with the slogan, um, you can, it's dry, but you can drink it. And um, they eventually did something good by investing into South African comedy and um, being the headline sponsor for like the SA Comedy Awards and, and so on and so forth. And during lockdown, they started like a virtual comedy bar, which was a nice outlet for comedians to actually make a bit of money and for us to see our favorite comedians. But what I felt Savannah slept on was the pockets of, of easing of lockdown regulations and how people embraced the drink how urban culture was trying to move them out of their comfort zone and say, hey man, this is what you are to us. You are our alpha, our omega, you are our, our theme song to groove, our choice of, 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 of happiness, you know what I mean? Like, you're the catalyst of how happy groove makes us feel, you know? And Savannah saw this and put out a statement and condemned it. I'm like, how? How do you take your best marketing strategy ever and you say, no, this is not us? It's your audience is guiding you where you guys should be playing. And you go, no, 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 it's not us. We want these guys to sit at the bar and tell dry jokes. That's rubbish. So I found that very worrying, you know? And, and for that, like, Savannah's bop. So um, in whatever you do, I mean, um, we all do like different things. I mean, I see people from f and um, I know there's a lot of um, entrepreneurs, you know what I mean? Um, do not be imprisoned by the initial plan because um, chances are it's going to change, you know? So um, embrace where culture is going and where innovation is going and see how you can find yourself in that space. And the last and most valuable lesson that I learned is that in order for culture and brands to move forward, creatives like myself, storytellers like Kerwin, and technology like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, need to empathetically work together for innovation to take place.
And that's exactly how we were able to sell my, my Magic Day Club uh, show from 2020. So to cut a long story short, and I said this the last time I was here, is that, yes, definitely pass this course. <laughs> but after you leave here, throw away the rule book. Throw away the rule book because what worked last year is definitely not going to work this year. And what worked the year before didn't work last year. So you literally take what you want from, from what you're studying now or from what you're learning right now and see what will work for you. But don't regurgitate the rule book and in the hope that it'll work. And I want everyone to say this with me because there are no fucking rules to the shit. <laughs> no rules whatsoever. My name is Gutlan Ntlapo and any questions? <laughs>